All right, uh, in this next lecture, we're going to take a look back at the Nyquist theorem. Uh, and I've mentioned to you it over and over and over again. If I'm interested in f minimum to f maximum, uh, this tells me I have to sample strictly greater than twice f maximum. That's the Nyquist theorem. And any signal, the, con the, uh, the converse of that, is any signal that exists as an amplitude greater than the resolution and above FF, 1 half fs is going to alias. Okay? We can think of aliasing in, uh, in, the, um, in a voltage sample, uh, but we can also think of aliasing in images. And so this is a graphic image. Let's, so what this is is a 24 frames per second uh, camera on a wheel, okay? And you've uh, seen it as the wheel is supposed to be going, uh, the wheel is going faster and faster and faster. But if you slow it down enough, you can see which way it's supposed to be going, right? Uh, and all I do is have the, that's your lab 10 motor right there with a wheel stuck on it, and I'm increasing the voltage so it spins faster. So you can see that it's supposed to be going counterclockwise. And if you put enough motor, put enough voltage into the motor, the spokes actually are going the wrong way. Or worse, the spokes stop. Okay? And this is the essence of aliasing. Aliasing doesn't change the amplitude. The image isn't morphed. It isn't crooked. Okay? But the frequencies are shifted. Okay? So the essence of aliasing is to shift the frequencies. Okay, okay there's uh, Bard wants you to see his pretty picture. That's an actual guy, Henry, Harry. Okay. Okay. Uh, this you may completely ignore. Uh, don't ever quote the Valvano postulate. That's just, that's just my, it looks pretty if you sample 10 times faster, but all the math guys say two is enough. Okay. So you have my permission to, I won't ask Valvano postulate on this, but you get old and you start making stuff up. And, <laughs> That's what's awesome about it. You should become professor. It's the greatest job in the world. Because you know, what, what happens when I make a mistake in, in class? You guys either don't know or don't care. You know, you just, you're, you're, you're happy that you know, I get 99% of it right, <laughs> hopefully. It's about, you know, I get three, three out of every four things I say are probably correct. But if you're, you, are, you are professional engineers, you've got to go out and build stuff that works, right? When I mess up, you know, I have to apologize. But when you mess up, somebody dies, so be careful. You have a much harder job than I do, by the way. All right. Now, let me illustrate, um, let me illustrate aliasing with, um, with a voltage example. And this is, um, where is it? Position. Okay. All right. Uh, there's a link to this on the PowerPoint. Okay, so here's the, here's the deal. Uh, we got approximately an 8-bit converter, sampled at about once, 1 hertz. Okay, sampled at about 1 hertz. And so, and the input signal is over here. Okay. And so, if I oscillate this less than 1 cycle per 2 seconds, less than a half a hertz, what can you tell me about the relationship between the red, which is the digital sample, and the blue, right? Properly, except for my coffee tremors, tremors right, which are high frequency alias signals. But something fun happens if I oscillate this. I'm not really good at it, but if I were to oscillate this at exactly one second, one, two, no, not good. But let me, let me oscillate it even faster. Hmm? All right. You see what happened? I'm getting, I'm getting good at it. You see that? <laughs> what happened? What's it, what can you tell me about the relationship between the red? Assuming the blue was a sine wave. Okay. What can, if the blue were a sine wave, what can you tell me about the blue versus the red? Okay, what's changed? Now, 
I, I can't stop it, but I can look at you in the eye. Now, did the amplitude change? If I were wiggling up and down with, a, with an amplitude, did it change? Did the amplitude of that wiggle change? No. Unless I hit it exactly at 1 half fs, the amplitude could be zero. But assuming it's not exactly 1 half fs, or multiple of 1 half fs, the amplitudes are the same. And it turns out, uh, if I were to wiggle it at a beautiful sine wave, it's actually a sine wave. So it's still a sine wave. But two things have changed. Two things have changed. What are they? The frequency and phase have changed. Okay, so aliasing is the consequence of messing up the frequency. Okay, and if you go to a um, if you go to a, 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 a spectrum, all of this stuff in the in the alias bin gets shifted into here. Uh, and the awesome part is there's a formula for that frequency shift, by the way. Now, what can you tell me about the effective frequency as the input signal varies from 0 to 1 half fs? Okay. If it's sampled properly, the effective frequency is proper. Okay. Here's another rule. You don't get any frequencies above 1 half fs. And so it does this. So if I'm sampling at 100 hertz, okay, if I'm sampling at 100 hertz, like we did, we talked about our thermometer, and I put in a 100 hertz waveform, what happens? See that? What's going to happen? Fs, I don't want that, that's what we want. Okay, okay. And I put in some cosine 2 pi 100 hertz t. Okay. And I sample exactly once per period. Right. The guy's running around the track, and he runs, you know, takes him uh, 100 seconds to run around the track. And you are sitting in the stand, sleeping, and every 100 seconds you open your eyes. And the next 99 seconds you're, you know, eating your hot dog, okay? And then 100 seconds later you open your eyes again. What, what do you see? In the same He's in the same spot. Do you know where you see him? No. Okay, that's the phase relationship between the signal and your sampling process. But you're going to see what frequency? Zero. Okay? You're going to see zero. Okay. All right. Let me show you another one. All right. Uh, what we have here is a uh, sampling is fixed right here at uh, 1.6 kilohertz. Right, so I'm sampling at 1.6 kilohertz, and I have the ability to mix three different components onto that signal. Okay? Three different components onto that signal. For instance, if, the, um, if I add a constant plus two frequencies, one at 100 hertz, one at 200 hertz, okay? I get a waveform that looks like this. And if I look at the spectrum created by this 16-point sample, I know everything about the, about the signal. Yeah, come on. There we go. I know the DC component, which in my spectrum is at the first sample. I know the, the, the magnitude of the, um, of the 100 hertz, which was 0.75. And I know the magnitude of the 200 hertz, which was, which was 0.5. And if I looked at the complex part, I would get the phases right as well. Okay. So if I properly sample, uh, I can recover everything about the signal. Okay. Everything about the signal. And so interesting with this example is what happens if, uh, let's just look at one of them. Let's shut one of these off. Shut one of these off. And let's make this 
be uh, 900 hertz. Okay, so I gave you the formula before. Uh, not, uh, yeah, eight, eight is, 800 hertz is the one half FS. So what am I going to see at 900 hertz? If I put a 900 hertz in, sample that, uh, sample that uh, 1.6 kilohertz, what am I going to see? It goes up and down and up and down. Well, I mean, I'll, okay, I'll do an easy one for you. You guys are, you guys are you know, slow here. What if I sample it at, what if I put in 1.6 kilohertz? Now what am I going to see? Uh, fine, that's why we have this thing. Okay. It's going to look like DC. Okay. How about 1.5 kilohertz? This one's fun. Where is it? Up here. Hmm. See, it's a beautiful uh, 1.5 kilohertz waveform, but it doesn't look like 1.5. Okay? It looks like 100. And the, and the phase is flipped, by the way. Okay? So I put in 1,500, and the computer sees sees 100 hertz. And what is this telling me? If I see these samples in my, in my memory, what is it? Is it 100 hertz or 1500? You can't tell. So what does your lab partner do to ease your sleeping at night? We just did it a couple at the beginning of the lecture today. Right? If I add a 26 hertz low pass filter, right? That ain't, well, whatever. What, I'm going to add a filter at greater than 1 half FS. If I add a, uh, in this case here, if I, if I were to add a, 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 an 800 hertz low pass filter, I would be sure that that's 100 hertz and not 1500. See that? That low pass filter, that analog low pass filter, lets me sleep at night to know that this is not 1500. Uh, what's 1700, by the way? Jay, what if I put in 1,700? What am I going to get? The same stupid waveform. So there's a whole bunch of frequencies that could be confusing us. But again, that low-pass filter might this happen. Let me teach you one more thing with this that uh, is, is a little bit annoying for you digital guys. Okay? And that is... Okay, just to show you, uh, let's put this back to 100 hertz, right? 100 hertz, you know, no, no magic. 100 hertz is 100 hertz, okay? It's not 1700, it's not 1500. What about 50 hertz? Am I, is Nyquist going to come put me in jail? No. 50 hertz is less than 800. Okay. But something god awful happens. Something weird and stupid happens. Let's look. Okay. <laughs> and look at the spectrum. And what I did here is I plotted. And the problem has to do with the 16, by the way. Okay? This is a 16-point uh, window. And whenever you do a discrete Fourier transform, you have to have a, you have to have a window size. And what I'd, uh, and look at, look, you know, that's actually what it's doing this, that's actually what it's doing the transform on. And let me remind you something that I said long ago that matters. Okay? And that is, uh, we can think of the range of voltage, the precision of voltage, right? So when we think of the sampling process. We think of the, right, the number of data points here and the resolution between the two. But we said something else, right? What was the other thing we, when we drew this plot? What else did I, was I interested in? Sampling. The frequency, right? 
And so we drew it, we drew arrows this way, right? And what was this? Delta T, which is one over the sampling rate. But just like we had a finite number of samples, just like we had a finite number of samples in this dimension, we have a finite number of samples in that dimension. Let's call it capital N. Okay? And the consequence of this is a frequency resolution, which is Fs over N, where N is in, uh, you know, in my case, N was only 16. And so my frequency resolution was only 100 hertz. Okay. When over here, we saw that the resolution was equal to the range. Uh, da, ba, da, da, da. Resolution, yeah, was equal to the range over the precision in alternatives. And so there are analogous uh, considerations whenever we sample, and that is the amount of time, which is equal to the number of samples divided by Fs. This is an important parameter whenever we look at the frequencies of things. All right. Let's just summarize. All right. So in summary, the Nyquist jail says that if you're interested in uh, F minimum to F maximum, please sample them bigger than, than uh, twice F maximum. If you put in a low pass filter, Okay, that means that you can reconstruct everything about that signal. If you sample long enough, right, if you sample long enough, you can reconstruct everything about that signal. Okay? And that low pass filter has to pass your signals of interest and reject. All right, uh, question?